Souse us, therefore, in the powdering tub of thy mercy. That we may be tripes fit for the heavenly table. Welcome, Meatsmiths. You are listening to a Meatsmith Harvest. Restoring husbandry to prosperity. By means of the traditions of our fathers. This Farmstead Meatsmith production is made possible by you. If you like it, please consider supporting our team by going to patreon.com backslash meatsmith and donating at a level you'd enjoy giving at. Your gift helps us increase the quality and quantity of all our free media education. Thank you and happy harvesting. Okay. If you have a sufficiency of bacon in the household, then you can pursue, you're freed up to pursue the goods of the soul, such as music. Yeah. You know, we've been doing a lot of that lately. Yeah. It's been really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even, uh, even the children that are not quite as um, naturally inclined to musical rigor, they're taking up their own instruments and it adds to the full flavor of the family, I think. Yes. Yeah. That's an interesting point, actually. Because, you know, we have one child who is just gifted musically and, and motivated. He'll just hear a song, then he'll sit down and he will figure it out. Even if it's relatively advanced, he'll do it. It comes to him with ease. And then we have another child who is not gifted in that way, but he has a little more fortitude generally in his pursuits. So he, he'll, he's willing to push through. Um, but there's another element I think that has helped that second child, mm -hmm. and that is the f the the beauty of the instrument itself. Ah, uh, absolutely. You know, yeah. You can underestimate uh, the inherent value of a thing well and beautifully made. Yeah, and that uh, on its own is a substantial inspiration. It is. That's, that really supplies what, you know, or helps supply what might lack in natural talent. Mm -hmm. And that's why it would be, it would have been so wrong. I'm glad we jumped for a nicer instrument, a higher quality instrument, because it would have been um, deleterious. It would not have worked to just go, well, you know, maybe he's not that into it because he's maybe he's not necessarily as naturally gifted. So we won't, we'll just get a cheap one. Uh-huh. What a horrible sentence right. to pronounce upon someone like uh -huh. you don't get to do this, <laughs> but we went for a nice one and it's, it's just such an inspiration to play. And it is so a nice instrument is, uh, again, <laughs> if the matter is good is, uh, it is effortlessly mm -hmm. sonorous and beautiful. Yeah. I mean, and he likes to work with wood in general. Mm -hmm. And so, I think, and then learning a little bit about resonance and the science of um, <clears throat> musical vibrations and tone and how you put in literally like how you construct a wooden instrument yeah, um, so that it will sound wonderful. Yeah. That has been, that, that gets him hint in his soul. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So. And yeah, that's like the, it's the opposite of the, the tyranny of low expectations, mm. which is, that's like the worst thing you can do to a human <laughs> is here, you're not up to it or whatever. So we're going to give you the garbage and you go ahead and uh, <laughs> it just means you're not worthy of ascending to the heights that you are ordered towards. Mm -hmm. That's bad. Yeah. I know it's a temptation that happens a lot. Yeah, yeah. We do that to ourselves. We've... Yeah. I mean, it's really tempting to any homeschooling family too, is, well, you have to work hard to earn hmm. a certain threshold of um, investment on my part, which may be true at, in a, a little bit, but not all the time. You have yeah. to discern when you need to, uh, when you need to use that route versus I'm going to go ahead and give you something that's way beyond you. And you're going to be wowed by it thereby yeah. elevating you. Yeah. You will, you'll be drawn up. Yeah. You have and, to do that a little bit with yeah. kids. Yeah. Well, and with humans. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all yeah. need that. Yeah. Like if I think that's the same adage, uh, you know, the adage expresses that same principle 
you know, you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's a particular kind of condescending crime to regard someone as unworthy and therefore to feed them garbage. Like you won't be able to tell the subtlety of this nice wine yeah. or the actual real quality of this um, home reared acorn finished hickory smoked mm -hmm. bacon that is not made by anyone except for me smiths and 19th century peasants and doesn't <laughs> exist anywhere no. um and it, the similar a similar concept is when you give people bad tools like musical instruments or even when they're serving the noble science of their home economy mm -hmm. and that our, our kitchens are just plagued with this condescending dysfunction mm -hmm. they're only ordered towards uh pre-packaged like ready-made food yeah. but you give a housewife a householder a husbandman give them a kitchen that does things give yeah. them pans that work yeah. give them pots that are heavy and well made and uh, give them knives that are sharp mm -hmm. and beautiful give them wood cutting surfaces um Give them the tools that are proper to their natural ends, not cutting across them. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's an assertion of, I think, you know, love. Like it that mm -hmm. that's how you love a person mm -hmm. is you yeah. call them to hire. Yeah, I had an experience this weekend. We had a parish mission last week. It took up all of our week. Mm -hmm. Like I had to stop homeschooling. <laughs> The world is just kind of halted um, so that we could try to catechize our kids in that robust way, which you need to do once in a while. And we, um, so we went to all the daily catechisms and then we, we also went to, you we went to the evening um, missions. sermons. Yeah, yeah, missions. And, but it uh, kind of meant we didn't have any family meals like all week mm -hmm. for like basically five days in a row. And then you had Scola. It was, it was like, we really were kind of disbanded as a family for mm. a whole week. Good things were happening still. Mm. So, I, and it wasn't horrendously like malforming us, right. but we definitely felt it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you picked up on it, but the kids and I had a couple conversations where we're like, okay, it's Saturday. We need to have a big family meal. Mm -hmm. And because we felt like okay, we're just eating yogurt. We're sort of like getting by with like less yeah. le kefir. Yeah. Like quick, healthy stuff, but not like that sit down elevated, mm -hmm. you know, get the, get the, you know, we're eating off paper plates. So yeah, <laughs> like get the, get the actual plates out and let's do this. Let's have a family meal mm -hmm. where everyone's like unified. Yeah. That was, that was really good. Yeah. <laughs> Finally have after not having it. I'm just, I don't know if that piggybacks off of what you were saying, but yeah, to, to endeavor, to endeavor, to rise and give yourself, go ahead and give yourself something that's valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's not just valuable. It's like, uh, it's proper. It's harmonious. Yeah. It accords with who and what, who and what we are. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so pernicious to kind of short circuit that by tricking us with apparent infinite variety of food mm -hmm. that tantalizes only our immediate gratification with a with flavor and then totally undercuts the promise of flavor, mm -hmm. which is nutrition. Mm -hmm. Like that's the order mm -hmm. of creation, which is a thing tastes good when it's ripe. Uh huh. Cause it's also the best for you at that time, but you know, it serves nutrition <laughs> yeah. and flavor in equal measure. Mm -hmm. Um, and that puts you into the seasons and the seasonality of everything. Um, but it's form and function are univocal mm -hmm. to serve the same end, which right. is the good, the bodily good of, of the human. And it's just, uh, and then that's why I think you can have, you can have, uh, errors in both directions. You can just go nutrition and yeah, you could just IV nutrients into your body, mm -hmm. all the full spectrum of nutrients <laughs> and never taste a thing, um, in your effort to serve nutrition only. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. That's a defect. Mm -hmm. Uh, or you could just 
eat ice cream all the time uh -huh. and go for max indulgent flavor all the time. <laughs> um, but both are, uh, they're both a vice. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they degrade your nature, mm -hmm. which is why I think everyone should raise a pig in their backyard. Okay. <laughs> While we're talking about it. <laughs> yes. So um, we were planning on not actually sitting down and talking right now. We, we did that. We had a guest and um, this is you and I right now. We're, we're trying to just introduce him, but we keep getting sidetracked by lofty ideas. So we talked about that, a very idea that this, this spectrum, the, the two mm. ends, um, the two extreme ends of the virtue, which is in the mean of um, eating well, nourishment, nourishment, mm -hmm. homesteading, even um, why you homestead, sort of the, mm -hmm. the, the motivation behind it. Is it nutrition? Is it flavor? Is it, what is it? So anyway, yeah. so we have a guest that um, we get into that a lot with, and he's actually a philosopher, theologian, um, his name is Dr. Richard Malosh, and he, um, I think he would only want to be called a philosopher. Okay. Not a theologian. Oh, okay. That's yeah. news to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think. Thomas go either way. <laughs> it seems like. Yeah. But okay. I'm mm -hmm. glad you said that. Um, and, uh, hopefully we'll have him on and I can ask him that question yeah. <laughs> again. <laughs> again. We'll, we want to do another episode. Um, so, but he, we first met him. He's a fellow homesteader as well on the ground. He's got lots of, um, animals, lots of kids too. And so he's just, he's doing the family homesteading thing alongside of us. And so, um, that's who we're going to really engage with for this episode and the next one. Um, yeah. And the cool thing is he, he brings the, he's more thoroughly formed by the pre-modern philosophy mm -hmm. of St. Thomas Aquinas which is not limited to that particular saint, but that's, that was the philosophy that flowered, you know, from, from St. Thomas, but definitely planted by Aristotle. It's, it's classical philosophy. It is the philosophy that, um, accords with reality. So that's the one big benefit that it has to modern <laughs> philosophies. And, uh, so it's really great to, to think about homesteading, from the perspective of its ends, mm -hmm. its purposes, mm -hmm. um, why you do it, why you raise animals. Uh, and that's one of the things that I think modern philosophies are particularly defective in. They can't do it because the whole premise of modern philosophy is that the ends don't exist if they're abstract because mm -hmm. everything is basically materialist. Um, and so if we don't have the ends, we, the means become unintelligible and then we just start doing means for the sake of means. Right. That's mm -hmm. a problem. Uh -huh. We start having money in order to create more money. In fact, mm -hmm. we even raise food, uh, in order not to nourish ourselves, mm -hmm. but to sell the food or the property it's on, um, through speculation to multiply legal tender. Mm -hmm. And so we have taken a means and we've made it an end, mm -hmm. simply the multiplication of, of cash monies. Mm -hmm. Um, if only it were cash mm -hmm. of whatever money is these days, I don't even know, but <laughs> all of that to say, you know, that's a deficiency of the modern, the modern era. Yeah. Whereas if you look at things in accord to their ends, you actually understand them. Mm -hmm. Um, their T loss, you know, their purpose and, uh, it gives them the context and Pope Leo the 13th has this great phrase. I can't remember which encyclical it's in, but, um, when you understand, when you attempt to understand something outside of the influence of its causes, you lose that thing. Okay. Yeah. And in, in just classical Catholic philosophy, everything being is understood, but four causes, there are four causes to everything. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, the formal cause, the material cause, the efficient cause and the final cause. And it's really simple and it's really clarifying. Um, and it's almost, uh, adolescent. Mm -hmm. It's how kids think mm -hmm. if, if they're not, you know, uh, messed up in the brain by their parents or their culture. Uh -huh. And 
So anyway, mm -hmm. Dr. Malash brings that incisive clarity yeah. of Thomistic philosophy that I just think is so great. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> it rightly orders it because homesteading, farming is one of those things. And we've been in it long enough that we've seen this happen. But it's one of those things that can lose its end. If, it, if it's removed from one of the influence of one of its causes, mm -hmm. we start to get confused. That's very true. And uh, one of the immediate results is burnout. People don't, yeah. they stop doing it. Or, I mean, gosh, yeah, actually, we don't need to get like real dark or anything. But uh, this <laughs> happens. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, they, <laughs> um, things go badly. Mm -hmm. They go badly. Um, it's really sad when your when your ends aren't clear and uh settled yeah i mean you're engaging with reality yeah and um gravity is real and fire is real and water is real and yeah and these things cause destruction at right. times to to not only land and animals but yourself sometimes i mean yeah it can be kind of destructive yeah so you have to know why you're doing it yeah the causes mm -hmm. before yeah. you get into it yeah yeah but he's great for that and i think um one of the yeah that's that's always one of the goals of our pig classes too yes that's why we call it the family pig yeah so you can have the end clearly uh in view yes the end is the bodily good of the family yes okay so <clears throat> I brought him up because we're, um, I didn't want to spend time when he was on the air, uh, talking about our classes, but we have three family pig classes, um, on the books for this spring. They are April 25th through 27th, May 2nd through 4th and May 16th through 18th. So one at the end of April and then two at the beginning of May. And, um, there are so many that we've already talked volumes about this class. Um, we've, <laughs> we've added other classes that are actually becoming quite popular in and of themselves, but, um, the family pig really is still our flagship class and it has so much to offer. So you were starting to say having the pig, Yeah, that is the magnanimous endeavor yeah. that will enrich your table, the family table. And, um, yeah. So that I just talk about that for a little bit and well, yeah, it's interesting that it is our flagship because it, it is as much as I try to, you know, I don't want to degrade any of the other classes because they're all awesome. Yeah. And so it's not necessarily the class itself, I guess, that is somehow superior, but it's the animal. It's the, it's the pig. <laughs> it's the glorious pig. And uh -huh. there's, and I, there's this one great line from uh, father Speltz who writes about St. Thomas mm -hmm. and agrarian philosophy. Uh, but you know, economy is the science of managing the household. Uh -huh. That's what economy is. Mm -hmm. And it has more to do with the judicious, prudent dispersal mm -hmm. of the goods, just the bodily goods of food, clothing, shelter of the bodily goods of the household, mm -hmm. dispersing them to, uh, to the members of the distinct individuals that are members of that social group of the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are things that serve economy and uh, this science of household management. And that's even what William Cobbett calls it too. It's just good management. Uh -huh. um, and uh, the things that serve that are the productivity of nature, the mm -hmm. natural productivity of nature. Mm -hmm. And then the husbandry of the person. Mm -hmm. Because that productivity of nature is just latent. It's just kind of this raw potential that's sitting there mm -hmm. that has to be um, nourished and nursed and uh, through science and craft and, uh, and virtue it has to be nursed into food, into the, the distinct bodily goods for the family by husbandry. Mm -hmm. And I love that St. Thomas, uh, he, he kind of talks about farmers teachers and uh, medical doctors in the same way. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. They all have to work with their matter um, in a docile way. Mm. 
So mm -hmm. there is a potency, there's an etern internal principle to nature, there's an internal principle to our bodies, there's an internal principle to the human mind mm -hmm. uh, that has to be cooperated with. It's got this potency that has to be cooperated with in a docile manner, not just simply coerced and forced. Mm -hmm. So like, otherwise it won't work. You right. will not have productivity. Right. So the farmer obviously has to work with the seasons. He has to work with the nature of the plant, even if he's gonna hybridize and breed plants into you know producing apples that keep longer. Like he's still cooperating with the natural order mm -hmm. there um, and drawing from it. And then similarly with, uh, an actual medical doctor. I know. <laughs> well, I so just... sad. We have to qualify that, but we yeah. do, um, where they have to work with the natural order of the human body mm -hmm. in order to restore that order to restore yeah. health. Mm -hmm. They can't, well, I guess they do, but not to good effect, <laughs> but they can't just go right over it. Excuse me. Yeah. They can't just, mm -hmm. you know, totally disregard the, the natural order of the body. And similarly, when you're educating someone, according to St. Thomas, mm -hmm. You are, they have this late, this potency in the intellect mm -hmm. for truth. It's ordered yeah. to truth, um, but it doesn't have it literally. Yeah. So the teacher must give it, but um, in a way that is drawing upon the structure yeah. that is there yeah. in the student. Yeah. And so there's this, uh, it's husbandry as opposed to just like taking my raw, raw materials putting them into a shape that they do not have yeah. on their own mm -hmm. and, and don't have in any context apart from excessive coercion and then producing a widget, you know, right. or something yeah. out of that. Yeah. Um, so a house builder, while still a craftsman in a different way, is not necessarily on the same level for, for St. Thomas. Uh -huh. he, he's, he, he, he doesn't have to be as docile to the order that is there yes. in, his, in the raw material. I got it. Because okay. uh, he's really shaping and informing it, you huh. know, through technology. Well, okay. To other yeah. ends. Yeah. All of that to say, my goodness, what am I talking about? <laughs> uh, but the um, pig, the, the household pig. economy mm -hmm. uh, is the kind of thing that is served by this natural productivity of nature mm -hmm. and the skill, the virtue, the craft of the husbandman mm -hmm. or the housewife mm -hmm. and uh, made into bodily goods. And those things serve household economy. Yeah. But the pig. The pig is special. The pig, I would argue, zealously serves uh -huh. household economy <laughs> uh, because uh -huh. it is so harvestable on the home scale, mm -hmm. um, which is to say the small scale. And it is so dense nutritionally and it requires so relative to the other animals. This is unique of the pig. Uh, relatively uh, minor input mm -hmm. for an immense harvest, mm -hmm. you know, so especially your home reared pig, e even in the industrial setting, you know, the pig has the highest meat to bone ratio mm -hmm. and super fast grow out um, and the highest feed food conversion mm -hmm. rate. Um, but uh, whereas a cow, you know, it takes much longer um, and has different efficiencies, but, uh, and then you get a home reared pig that's going to be way fatter. Mm -hmm. And then all of those efficiencies just, they, they increase exponentially mm -hmm. with a home reared fat little porker. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's on a whole nother level that just so zealously serves the economy of the household. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. it's part of that virtue. And we have domesticated that pig so effectively mm -hmm. when you get to, this is the advantage of the older breeds that not only you know do they fill our table with just such abundance and nutrition that tastes good and is good for mm -hmm. you uh but they are fun to have around yeah they're cute yeah i know and they're sweet and they're calm yeah um so they just they zealously serve the household I yeah think. yeah 
It's like the partnership between a dog and a man, um, mm -hmm. almost. I don't want to quite make yeah. that equivocation, but it's almost at that level of like yeah. delight mm -hmm. and the human scale. Like mm -hmm. when they're just it's still in the backyard, in the farmyard. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to mention that the texts that we sort of loosely engage with mm -hmm. are De Reino on Kingship by Thomas Aquinas. And what do you have over there? This is a great one. It's The Importance of the Rural Life and by St. Pius X Press by Father George Speltz, priest of the Diocese of Winona from back in the day, the 1940s. Okay, but it's it's a it's going through Thomas's Yes, it's his thesis. Yeah. And it's uh yeah, it it takes St. Thomas and um because St. Thomas does not, I mean he almost does, but he doesn't give an explicit mm -hmm. agrarian philosophy. The closest he gets is into De Regno yes. and to his commentaries on Aristotle's politics, I think. And it's real, it's still very full, but um, he doesn't give an explicit philosophy on it. Yeah. And so Father Speltz kind of combs through everything, the Summa and okay. his works. And he, he brings one together, which you can do when you're, <laughs> when you have St. Thomas, because he's starting with elemental principles right. um, that because they are true, meaning they accord with the thing that is real, uh, their application is just exponential. Mm -hmm. in in every realm you can mm -hmm. you can apply it to everything and it's just it's yeah. very clarifying and it's not you know the beautiful thing about saint thomas is it's not i don't know it's not excessively abstract and yeah. what we tend to think of in the modern definition of the word metaphysical um it's yeah it's scientific yeah. in the sense that it's a very ordered rational progression of thought yes. that immediately makes sense mm -hmm. to again that native structure that you have in your brain already yeah it's already there and all he's doing is bringing clarity mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. bring clarity to it i would say um these are so so thin too i mean they're like manuals yeah almost. so so quick they're very accessible to um an armchair uh philosopher like we are now mm -hmm. <laughs> um but but the but the farmer philosopher you know the thinker i know you're out in the fields i know you're in your pig pen in your barn whatever your tedious chores and i know you're thinking mm -hmm. that's what we do like why am i doing this you know yeah <laughs> or um what can i learn from the the task that i'm doing mm -hmm. right now you know about myself about the world about god and um these books are so fun to engage with because like you said they start with elemental principles and then they build and we're already such principled people that um, it can, it's actually very uplifting to go, you know, I thought that, but I just hadn't like used logic to like arrive there in an official way. And it, it, it's kind of like confidence building to read mm -hmm. Thomas and go, yeah, like that's really human. And mm -hmm. everything around me in this culture is telling me the opposite, Yeah, but I don't want to think that I want to think this about reality. Mm -hmm. And, um, so these books, I think, they're a great introduction to Thomas if you don't want to just like dive into the Summa, which I get. Um, but you like, there's a lot of people talking about Thomas, St. Thomas right now, and um, it's a great way to kind of ease into his thought without being overloaded, especially if you're already an agrarian thinker. Yeah, there's, there's so much that is um, great matter for contemplation on the farm. One of the most mm -hmm. fruitful ones for me has been the social groupings of animals. Yes. And their particularities in mm -hmm. that. And uh, it's amazing. It is a way in which these these creatures participate in a higher, um, a higher level of life, I think, mm -hmm. because they obey rules, you know, that are they're rooted in their nature and in their their sensory reactions to things, but man, there certainly seems to be a principled abstract. Well, there isn't, that's what order is. Hmm. It transcends the distinct individuals. Um, and it manifests itself mm -hmm. and we have the intellect, we have the ability to perceive this thing 
um, that is order. And it only, which is so beautiful. You see it in a herd of sheep and a flock of sheep, you know, or in even poultry. Um, there is an order to their movement that transcends the mere um, immediate bodily reactions of each individual. Mm -hmm. And it's so cool to see that order. And it only is visible because all the individuals are distinct mm -hmm. and they follow rules <laughs> pigs follow rules yes right <laughs> and yeah. if you're going to raise them on a on a they follow a regular you know uh a, almost a ratio a, a, it's it's almost reason but uh -huh. it's not we we see it that way because that is sort of what it is above them in a strange way but they and if if you go against that on a it, it, the, the unique thing about the domestic scale, about farming on a small scale, is that you have to cooperate with that rule, mm -hmm. with that regular, with the pigs, because you don't have the luxury of um, actual physical barriers or real, like, literally two feet of concrete right. and steel. Well, if that, you, if yeah. you have that, you don't forget about it. You don't care about the social order of pigs. Right. Well, it's that docility that you're talking about before. Yes. Like, the farmer has to be docile. Right. Or, yeah, we do need two feet of concrete. On yes. every side of the animal. Yes, yeah. to to um, absolutely, so that we can ignore the order of the pig itself, the right. the potential distinctive uniqueness of the pig's nature, mm -hmm. because we don't actually want any part of that. We just want to extract protein and sell it for the highest dollar. Right. So that's um, yeah. that's a different end because we have a different end. Right? Yeah, that yeah. that perverts mm -hmm. the the order and the the mm -hmm. nature of the pig. But on a home scale, you don't have those things. That's right. So you actually have to have a relationship with your pig. And I don't mean, I don't mean the silly relationship uh, that people anthropomorphize in the modern era, not the pet thing, but literally a relationship that is essential to the social order of the homestead. Mm -hmm. So you can't have relationship without distinction. So you have to make this distinction. I am the human. The pig is the creature mm -hmm. and he, he is ordered towards my nourishment. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that elemental distinction mm -hmm. understood as a truth of reality, then you can't actually have a relationship with that pig. Mm -hmm. And your relationship with that pig is the efficient cause. Mm -hmm. It is the like sort of the, the power, the motor that generates that creates social order mm -hmm. the the peace the tranquility mm -hmm. of the homestead wow. and so when we understand a pig in that way as distinct mm -hmm. and as lower we actually enable it to fulfill its nature yeah which is the extremely noble cause of serving human nourishment whereby a pig becomes human cells which is crazy. Uh -huh. That's the that's the everyday miracle of nutrition. We don't mm -hmm. even think about. Mm -hmm. But when we imbibe things, we deconstruct them, and their substantial form mm -hmm. becomes us. It alters completely. It's this crazy thing. Mm -hmm. um, nourishment is, mm -hmm. and it's a very noble end. And that's that's what we do with the pig. And all of that to say, you have to cooperate with their nature yeah. in order for that that um that peace to precipitate mm -hmm. and so you have to fence them in a persuasive manner <laughs> you have to keep them complacent and happy with their state <laughs> uh -huh. in life yeah. and they want to do that mm -hmm. um, you just have to hold up your end of the deal and give them society mm -hmm. and shelter food good food mm -hmm. water and cleanliness mm -hmm. and and then they are literally a part of your household mm -hmm of your household management. Yeah. And, um, and, it, and you, and then the tranquility of order will reign, which is what peace is. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's really why we call it the family pig. Cause I just can't divorce the, the pig from that end. Yeah. Cause that's what it's about. Yeah. So many of the people that end up coming to our, our family people, mm -hmm. um, either, I mean, at, at every end of the spectrum, maybe they're young and they're just married, um, or maybe they're established husbandmen um, or housewives, um, or their grandpas and they're helping out their 
their children who are just starting out, you know, there's yeah. so many, but it all is order to the family. Really good people that, that have mm-hmm. that, that common end. Um, so, so do come, do come to the family pig. Um, you guys all have the ends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think many of you, many of our listeners do. So we can help you with the means and, um, and then also the camaraderie that we have too. I have to keep highlighting that too. It's so real. I mean, in this culture, we're just like, uh, it's the desert of the real. And mm-hmm. so we, um, it's a, it's a highlight moment in people's years. I think when they come, um, they go back and they, and they carry on, um, that same fellowship feeling and, and culinary, mm-hmm. um, magnanimity into their own homes and their, their own uh, neighborhoods as well and, and their families. And um, <laughs> I don't want to give too much away, but at one point in our interview with Dr. Malash, he was making the case, and I don't want to say why, but he made this really poignant um, point that there are no more characters mm, in this mm-hmm. society of Like ours. really interesting, unique people. Unique people. That are a little weird, but, but yeah, yes. they're characters. They are lovable Uh and they are unique. Mm -hmm. And, and I just thought that's who comes to our class. It is. Yeah. We get, (laughs) we get, we get real people. We do. And because of that, they're, it's always a hoot. It's Mm. always like so fun and um, so memorable. And and we learn from each other too. You learn a lot from the students. Oh, I do. We get like shockingly competent people. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. In our classes. Yeah. Who will come and, You know, I've been Mm -hmm. raising animals on the domestic scale for a while. And when the initial enthusiasm and the, uh, the Instagram imagination wears off, Uh (laughs) which it does. And, you know, it did for me, like, I don't know, 20 years ago, I don't know how old (laughs) I am, but, but when that, when that initial, you know, amateurish zeal wears off, then you have the opportunity to make your homesteading into a virtue acquisition affair where yes. it's your, you need fortitude to do it. Mm-hmm. And so being a flawed human, you know, I have my defects in that way, but then it's great. It, usually <laughs> right when I'm like, Oh, I'm really tired of moving animals. <laughs> uh, I'll have someone come who is to a class uh-huh. who's very, very good at it. Yeah. Right. And, uh, they just reignite the passion and they'll, you know, especially on class weeks. I'm like, man, I do, yeah. I do not have time yeah. <laughs> to do all these animal chores. I got to yeah. go. We're getting ready for class. Like, yeah. you know, it's the schedule is it's extraordinarily full when we don't have anyone else to take care of the homestead. When we do these yeah. things, um, Wallace is even engaged in preparation yes. for the class. Yeah. So he's distracted. Uh, but, you know, students will show up early or oh, they'll stay here the night and they'll they'll just bring that uh, reminder Mm-hmm. of why we do it uh-huh. and they'll get up early with me it's like let's move the cows yeah I'm like, that's the thing i didn't want to do you know <laughs> <laughs> i just wanted to yeah. Uh, yeah. sleep in a minute or whatever yeah. you know yeah. ha- have breakfast before the class yeah. uh yeah. but they'll they'll get out and and we'll do it together and inevitably they'll bring something that's unique like uh, yes. we had a great you know coley came i don't know if i should mention his name but his name is coley he's a great guy he's in he was in New Mexico, I believe. So grazing is super important. Yes. Right? right? In a right. semi-arid or a solidly arid climate. And he has just mastered this beautiful way to graze cattle with pecans. And it's it's really awesome. And so it was great to have him. He came out and just, you know, the offer to help became the reignition of the virtue of rotating livestock. Yeah. As one must do. Yeah. Well... Sometimes when people offer to help, it's not helpful. That's right. And yeah. I don't, I don't, and I just mean outside of the scope of classes, yeah. like in general, uh-huh. when people want to help, it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know you want to help, but yeah. it's how much do I have time? How much time do I have to give you? Yeah. Um, uh, that, that's why our classes are so awesome. They actually are helpful. We actually do yeah. get help. <laughs> totally unique. Just with periphery things. We don't need help during the class, but these yeah. periphery things. It's like, yeah. Oh, you, you are a, a master grazeman. Yeah. You know, or, yeah. Um, Grass grower. Yeah. Yeah. So come to the family pig. 
listen to our uh, interview with Dr. Malash and um, hopefully uh, something will strike a chord with you. And we want to have him on again. Mm -hmm. We also want to try to have more interviews in general. If there are people that you think we would um, enjoy talking with that you'd like, you would enjoy us engaging with, um, please leave us a comment or email or something because we're starting to get into that now. We've got, finally, we've got good internet in the shop and um, a, a decent software that kind of makes it easy. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're now at the point where we can bring other guests on that we want to try to do. So um, without further ado, here's, here's Dr. Malash. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Malash. That's yeah, great. Thank you for having us. This is wonderful. Um, dear friends, obviously, and we're so had, glad that you guys are in the diocese of Tulsa and uh, kind of building up Christendom here <laughs> in eastern Oklahoma of all places. Yes. Well, we have you to uh, to blame or thank for getting us out here in That's right. large part. I take and, all credit. Yeah, definitely <laughs> thank because it was coming out to uh, do some uh, harvests with the Alquin Institute that put Oklahoma on our radar uh, in the first place. And yeah, I uh, remember it, too that I mean, I was, it was on some website and um, there's an article on rural life, farming, agrarianism. Yeah. I forget even which website it was, this article. And yeah. then I was reading the comments after this pretty good piece. And some guy just commented with this very profound insight about <laughs> kind of Catholicism and farming. I said, who is this lad? <laughs> Sheared of all persons. And so I was like, I got to get to know this guy. I think I reached out to you and. Yeah, uh, started a conversation and got you out to the diocese to do one of our harvest classes it's here through the Elk Institute. Yeah, yeah, and we did we did two of those, I believe, before we finally moved out. We did a a pig and a sheep harvest, I think, mm -hmm. and that was great. So, yeah, yeah, we still know people that are coming out of the woodwork that from that original event. That's right. Yeah, we are. We met. I met several of. Uh, the folks who are now our fellow parishioners mm -hmm. of most precious blood at that event. Um, mm -hmm. similar, a lot of them actually. Similar circles yeah. too, but yeah. Yeah. Clear yeah. Creekers. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Actually, I think we, we met almost all of them <laughs> at those really? events. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Or, you know, a huge portion of them. Yeah. Well, Dr. Malash, um, I think I've been wanting to have you on since we first met and, um, but I think in general, we have a lot in common. We both have large families and um, we both are trying in our different ways to incorporate faith and farming, um, which a lot of our listeners are on that same wavelength. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's why we first connected anyway, as you listened to Brandon and we just, there was an instant connection and overlap. Um, I have a little bit of a background in Thomism. I hate calling it that, actually. Just the philosophy and theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and Which so is the philosophy and theology of the church. The, right. There you go. Amen. Thank you. Very well put. <laughs> and so when Brandon returned from that original event, he goes, I met a man and he described himself immediately as a Thomist of strictest persuasion. Strict observance. <laughs> Strict observance. Yeah. Okay, that was it. And I oh. just loved it. Having come out of the uh, toxicity of Thomism, not of the strictest observance, um, it was very refreshing. And anyway, so we'll get into all of maybe what that means. But in a broad way, we're both Catholic. We're both trying to farm in, you know, messy ways. And we mm -hmm. both have big families, so it's definitely not a, you know, a tight operation. But um, maybe can you tell us in a general way how you weave, interweave the faith and farming and what that looks like for you and your family? Yeah, I mean, I think we share further similarities. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for me and my family, the kind of spearhead of entry into rural living was not principally because of my faith. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was principally because I just love to eat. Yes. Um, and I love food. And I love good food. 
not even looking at kind of the essential nutritional benefit of eating this way, but rather just because it tastes better. Yes. And as a consequence of just our family started growing more and more of our own food and enjoying that and inviting others to uh, participate in the, in the abundance of, of wonderful, good, wholesome, nutritionally dense food. Um, and from that, it kind of just snowballed. And then you start realizing all the other, not only bodily benefits of farming and sustaining your, your self and your family um, on a localized small scale farming, but also the tremendous spiritual and philosophical and epistemological benefits of living this way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, there's a fundamental dictum um, within Catholic theology is that the higher never negates the lower. Mm. And so the kind of theological foundations or principles that animate and has always animated the church's championing of rural life does not annul the kind of bodily lower benefits of living close to the land and having dirt underneath your nails. Yeah. The poor's head in hand bear I, bedecked with base and rosemary. How many people do you know who are building their home culture around seasonal harvest and feasting? Or that are hunting as you are for self-sufficiency and back-to-the-land values? Or that share your artist's passion for human-scale meat craft? At farmsteadmeatsmith.com, We've created a community of hundreds of omnivores from around the world with these shared goals and two major places for them to learn from and inspire one another. First, we have our semi-annual hands-on educational event, The Family Pig, here at our Heartland Homestead in Oklahoma. Come meet Brandon, get your elbows greasy, and over the course of three days, kill, cut, cure, and cook two pigs completely. You'll rub those greasy elbows with other meatsmiths from around the country, sharing meals and conversations to inspire you for years to come. Secondly, for more remote learning, over at farmsteadmeatsmith.com, we host a purely digital membership program with an archive of film and textual resources five years deep now. And both our on-site classes and online program include access to our most unique and rewarding private community Facebook page, Meatsmith Table, which is the only international network by and for homesteaders harvesting animals on a domestic scale using traditional and regional methods. We've been told that our classes are life-changing and the membership program unparalleled in quality and quantity. To get a taste of our education, search farmsteadmeatsmith.com and our YouTube channel for our free films, conversations, and downloads. Explore how we and other meatsmiths across the globe may best come alongside you and support you in building your home around the harvest. Please head to farmsteadmeatsmith.com today. But I, I believe that's similar to you guys too, correct? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've been through a couple, um, I don't know, I guess you could say existential crises in relation to that. Because, uh, you know, it starts off as so in undebatable. It's an undebatable proposition. It's a feature of reality that bacon that you cure tastes so good. And relative to the stuff that you purchase, it is, um, I always say it's not just a difference in um, degree, but in kind, like it's, it's mm -hmm. totally a different thing altogether. But then, uh, you know, maybe this was just uh, a, a flaw of my own mentality, but there's this weird, I don't know what it is, but it, it's like a, a strange modern stoicism sneaks in. It's like, well, this is just matter. This is just material. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it's not, uh, it is not a worthy end for our, for our labor. We have to, everything has to be spiritualized, um, or else it's not, it's not holy. It's not worthy of our time. Um, this just tastes good and, and that's not good enough. Um, and then I think that what I, 
what was so wonderful about discovering the philosophy of the church, the metaphysics of the church uh, in St. Thomas Aquinas was the antidote to either that, that stoicism or even just a, a pure, you know, indulgent materialism. Um, mm -hmm. where, uh, that, that would kind of frame, you know, agricultural labor is just, uh, it's, it's a hyper foodieism, you know, it's, it's foodieism on steroids and we just consume and, and it's, I guess it's Epicurean and that's, that's, yeah. that's the end there. Um, mm -hmm. but of course, Thomas and the philosophy of the church is not prey to either one of those extremes. Correct. Yeah. It's a via media. Yeah, but I'm all, but at the same time I'm always leery. Even in the spiritual life, maybe it's leery is a bad word. Maybe envious would be a better word. You know, of those individuals who just, you know, like a Saint Therese of the Zier, right? Just special yeah. grace to live a holy life, and it's like that's kind of cheating, right? I mean, it's like I mean, obviously <laughs> it's wonderful, but it, it makes it, it it's concerning. It's somewhat disconcerting, right? Because um, that's not normative. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to look at what a normative kind of arc looks like. Um, in regards to growth and spirituality is, you know, the confessions of St. Augustine. I mean, yeah. that's pretty, that's pretty normative of how God calls individuals to holiness and sanctity. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine it's the same way in regards to returning to the land, right? There are those who are motivated by theological and spiritual principles, but I'm leery of those people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's not right. It's not proper. It's not fitting. It's not normative. Um, yeah. Usually it's because of necessity, um, which yes. is a great good, or because of some other lower uh, pursuit, which yeah. God, which then God uses and draws up into mm -hmm. a more and, and purifies and, yeah. and drives up to, to higher intentionality. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You see this. I imagine you see this all, quite a lot because you 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 swim in these circles more than I do. Yeah. Of individuals who you know come at rural life with. Uh, kind of a philosophical theological framework first yes and i would imagine that often has all kinds of turmoil and tribulations and difficulties Probably. that if you come from the bottom up mm -hmm. um you don't really there's more sustainability i think in that in that method of approaching yes. and returning to the land mm -hmm. yeah and i see it in uh i've experienced it i should you know i'm guilty of the ex those extremes and the uh and I see it also in both from Trinitarians, but also uh, from people who don't claim any connection to any sort of uh, Christian faith at all. In fact, those are the ones that generally conjure the most, like you're saying, uh, spiritual, lofty, abstract um, elements around their agricultural pursuits. And mm -hmm. so they have, it, it's like a, uh, it's a secular um, Phariseeism or Puritanism. And I remember it's especially, you know, where we came from in, in Washington state. And if you, if you look at the way, at least they brand things, it's incredible. Like you'll have these vegan cafes that just tout all of their purities, their immaculate status, these high, you know, lofty principles of of we are gluten free and animal free, you know, animal protein free, and we are organic and we are non GMO. And it's just this list of, um, of that, that proves their perfection. And the name of the cafe is pure, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, it's, uh, so it, it not necessarily is comes from people who are explicitly religious because we definitely all are, but, uh, yeah, and it's that. Anyway, it it happens in in all of these in all of these realms. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, I have great hope for those people. Right? Yeah. Because, um, when they're wallowing in the mud, if you will, yeah. um, both theologically and reality. Um, yeah. I mean, it's. I don't think it's a tremendous leap to go from that kind of gnostic reality. As yeah. long as your your hands are in the earth, uh, I I can't imagine you staying there very long. Mm. Now yeah. the difficulty, of course, is with technology, right? Because mm. technology technology kind of blunts the the causation or understanding the causation of God within yeah. the confines of rural living. 
that's a really a, 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 a huge impediment. We don't have to go down those waters at this moment, but I would love oh, to come back at some point and talk about. Yeah, no, that's. Uh... That that could be a whole podcast too, because I that is a, a constant uh disrelish that I have that I struggle with. It's like we let's just roll the automobiles into the Arkansas River and <laughs> just let them go. And we'll just figure things out from there. Uh totally devoid of that that buffering of technology. Mm -hmm. Because uh yeah, and that's you know, it's interesting the at least in the in the Catholic or Christian world, I feel like what Lauren was talking about, there's there is this excess that can happen when we we say that there's so much grace in nature that if we just tie into nature deep enough and with enough conviction and we grow enough of our food, we will I don't know. It's like a sacrament. It will become a thing that gives us grace. And uh, the, the more we, we, we turn our heads down until the soil, uh, eventually we will find the divine, we'll find God. And, uh, but that also, that's more of a nouvelle theology thing. Yeah. That's a new Thomism thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that is not strictly observant of, of what Thomas said. But that too, you see that, that is, that is pretty common. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, maybe this is a segue, but I remember it was common to, I'm going to use a phrase here. It sounds lofty, but it's not, but when you conflate categories, when you, you, you cease to have purely nature and pure grace and you just sort of mix them. And, um, we used to call it the spiritual parfait. Like it's just sort of like gushy and like, there's sort of layers, but they're not clearly defined. And, um, oh, you called it the spiritual parfait, like on purpose. Yeah. Like in theology class, that's wow. what we were, that was the analogy we used. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. And then I realized very, very quickly the fallout of that. And when you don't keep these categories neat and clean, um, and where was I going with that? But um, well, what happens is when you don't keep things in their proper place, then you do get like Christian cafes, let's say, like coffee shops that advertise as being Christian and everyone inside of their working is clearly not living a very moral life or they're very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just very, very clear that, okay we maybe we have some element of assent or belief to some christian doctrines but we're not living from the ground up and it's like i don't know and so i i think i started to read maybe your thesis of a year or two ago and i was just i was like oh yeah this is very very clear and concise maybe you could help our audience and myself um <laughs> remember why it's good to talk. Well, we talk about nature a lot and everything's natural and organic and, mm -hmm. but we don't mean naturalism and we don't mean there's certain things we don't mean. Um, but anyway, could you help us maybe define what we mean by nature and grace and keeping these categories separate and, and why it's good to do so? Yeah. I mean, so when you're talking about like a, a Thomist of the strict observance, I mean, this is like one of the, the key, key distinctions between the various schools of Thomism, right? Mm -hmm. is this fundamental distinction between nature and grace. And again, yeah, you're right, De Lubac and others that follow the, the new theologians, if you will, um, were concerned of this kind of extremism where there's utter and complete separation between the two realms of nature and grace. And they're arguing for more um, uh, intimate union between the two, of course, and um, so this parfait, if you will, this mm -hmm. this muddying of the waters of the two, and as a consequence of that, they would see human nature as naturally deific, like naturally mm -hmm. ordered to union with God, and of course, this is completely um, distinct from what Thomas actually taught. And mm -hmm. of course, they're trying to draw on Thomas and they're drawing on certain elements of, of the thought of St. Thomas to make this, this argument. Um, but nonetheless, there's a immediate 
interpretation of St. Thomas, right? And of course, the Catholics, we, we maintain the, the importance of tradition and how tradition is, you know, one of the modes or means by which God reveals who he is and the fundamental realities of, of the cosmos and God's relation to that, to the cosmos. Um, and so within that larger Thomistic tradition, yeah, there's a fundamental distinction between the two realities, between nature and grace. Nature has an end. Human nature has an end. Um, which, according to the Thomistic tradition, is beatitude, but it's a, it's a natural beatitude. It's a natural mm. human happiness, um, which requires the cultivation of all the potencies of man. So his capacity to, to cultivate uh, virtue, um, which is simply using his higher faculties, namely his reason, uh, to govern his lower faculties, uh, namely his appetites and his passions. Um, and as a consequence of him being able to have that ordering within his soul, namely his intellect governing his body, he is then able to contemplate. Mm -hmm. uh, and contemplate what? Well, God, mm -hmm. right? Um, even, even the pagan philosophers would believe this, that man is able to understand the cause of all things, um, which again is, is in line with the Thomistic tradition. But to know God as cause of all things is really not to know God at all. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's akin to looking upon one's life and let's just say you had an absentee father and saying, well, I exist, therefore I must have a father. Hmm. Um, he, must, he must have existed or still does exist. And you can actually, if you're quite observant, discern certain qualities of your father. You know, if you're a tall son, you might say, well, I must, my father must have been tall. If you're bald, <laughs> possibilities that you know your father was bald and, and so yeah. you get able to discern certain qualities even mm. yeah. so the pagan philosophers of old independent of grace independent of any kind of divine revelation were able to know that god exists um we're able to discern certain attributes of god which is absolutely phenomenal even plato's some of the, the greatest philosophers were able to even conclude that this being who is the cause of all things the prime mover was triune which is incredible that mm. just through native natural intellect was able to contemplate these things. Yeah, and of course, there's point. certain internal and there's certain external requirements for happiness. You know, Aristotle speaks of the importance of friendship, of, 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 a, of a just ordering society in which you have uh, laws which facilitate as a teacher, the good life, uh, virtue, and so forth and so on. Um, and then Thomas would say, well, that's the kind of the natural end, but there's, and he calls it the imperfect end of man, imperfect mm. good. Mm. Uh, but there's a perfect good. And that perfect good does not annul, it does not destroy that natural good, but mm. rather elevates and perf perfects it. So not only can man know that God is, but he also can actually contemplate the very essence of God as a consequence of him revealing himself to us progressively through history and then in the fullness of time in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, and then he can turn his gaze not only upon God as cause, but God in his essence and understand him uh, in a perfect way. And of course, living uh, theological and um, infused wisdom, if you will, um, is a foretaste, an imperfect foretaste of that eternal beatitude which we receive in heaven when we'll see God face to face for eternity. Yeah. So there's a fun. My point is, all 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 of the saying is that there's a distinction between nature and grace, between what man can do by his native faculties and what man can now do when his faculties have been elevated and perfected by grace. Yeah. Yeah. And would you say that that's so when Thomas talks about the good life, or even, you know, so I think sometimes they translate Aristotle uh, with that same phrase, the good life or happiness. Eudonymia. Yeah, that that Greek word. Um, <laughs> that is even in Thomas's writings, that's on the order of nature, would you say on the level of nature? Correct. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, of yeah. Course, and the ancients and the and the Greeks and the and the medievals, um, well, more so the ancients, right? Those who came before the the advent of Christ, they were constantly frustrated. They knew the nature of man. They knew his end, the contemplation of the divine. Yeah. Um, but they were constantly frustrated because of the reality of fallen human nature and sin. Yeah. Uh, and so it must have been exceedingly frustrating for them because they knew the end. 
They knew what yeah. they were called to. And unless you had heroic um, uh, 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 virtue, yeah. and unless you had a just regime that would yeah. allow you to um, live a leisurely life of contemplation, it's yeah. almost impossible for, for man outside the, the Christian era to actually reach your natural perfection, let alone your supernatural perfection. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's interesting to see, you know, Aristotle, because I think Aristotle, I'm reading from a book that helps me understand these things. But for him, the good life in he wrote about the good life in the polit in politics. And uh, it's definitely tied to the state. Like you say, you know, a quote from that would be, when several villages are united in a single complete community, large enough to be nearly or quite self-sufficing, the state comes into existence, originating in the bare needs of life and continuing in existence for the sake of the good life. So it's almost like for uh, Aristotle, um, the end of the state is the good life, is to achieve the good life for the you know the the individuals for the families the citizens yeah yes right and then but uh saint thomas he you know he kind of adds he's got this great i think this comes from uh let's see this is from de regno so saint thomas's letter to the king of cyprus's son i think mm -hmm. and uh about how to be a king and he says uh for an individual man to lead a good life, two things are required. The first and most important is to act in a virtuous manner. For virtue is that by which one lives well. The second, which is secondary, and as it were, instrumental, and this is where the balance comes in, uh, is a sufficiency of those bodily goods whose use is necessary for our act of virtue. Mm -hmm. And so there it's, it's, it's not that stoicism of like, yes, in the absence of all bodily goods in complete depravity, you can be naturally happy if you just possess those virtues. Right. And maybe that's more like a, a Buddhist idea or a stoic idea. You know, it's just complete. Mm -hmm. All you need is the virtues and you're happy. And I think St. Thomas is like, no, uh, we are slash have bodies. We, we're hylomorphic. This is not, mm -hmm. um, it's part of our nature. You can't just excise that, that body from your being and just go for goods of the soul alone. And That's it's just right. interesting that he sees these, uh, you know, these, these bodily goods, a sufficiency of bodily goods, which is really precise mm -hmm. sufficiency mm -hmm. of bodily goods which makes me think we definitely don't need all this technology, but that's another thing, a sufficiency yeah. of bodily goods. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually instrumental to virtue somehow to, to the goods of the soul. That's right. To the, the spiritual faculties of man. Yes, that, yeah. and I think they're yeah they're beneficial in a new a number a number of ways. Um, but yeah, there's obviously an extreme where you can just excise, if you will, the 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 spiritual nature of man. Yeah, and don't worry about cultivating the life of the mind um, and habituating the will to the good, yeah. uh, and just concentrate solely on the perfection of the body. Right, the cult of the body. We see that rampant in our society, right? I, you mentioned yeah. this even at the beginning of the podcast. You have these two extremes. And the other extreme is say, well, you know, the, the uber pious individuals who are not concerned at all with the body and pursue solely the life of the mind or, or the spiritual life to the detriment of the body. And these are, yeah. yeah, two rampant extremes that we see in our society, which are repugnant to St. Thomas and to anyone yeah. with native, natural, human functioning reason. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're so easy to fall into, though, too. And I think it's you mentioned agnosticism. And it's, it's a little bit of that strain, too, where it's mm -hmm. just we have this, um, this immediate uh, preference for, uh, I don't know, the abstract goods. Um, and maybe it's, you know, a little bit of that Puritanism, too, that anything that it, and which is which is Gnostic, actually, uh, anything material is inherently evil. Um, mm -hmm. But again, to the, your point, what Thomas is saying here is that these goods that are necessary the, for the body are instrumental. Yeah, they're necessary, but instrumental. They're not an end in and of themselves, but mm -hmm. they're necessary for um, the exercising of these spiritual faculties of the human person. Yeah. And the danger yeah. is when you take those uh, means and, and understand them as ends, right? There's a confusion yes. of ends and means, uh, which is very, very problematic. Yeah. And this is where you get the excessives that we we're just talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that the, the just, and I think these primary bodily goods that he's talking about are, um, they are few and they are definable. Like everything in Thomas is definable <laughs> and intelligible. Uh, you know, it's, we need food, we need nourishment, we need clothing, mm -hmm. um, we need shelter and transportation. I think he even puts, you know, that as kind of a primary, mm -hmm. uh, bodily good. Mm -hmm. And, but would you, would it be right to say that they're like, obviously, like we just said, they're not the end. They're not the final cause of man, uh, but they are the material cause of the virtues. Like they're the matter mm. on which virtue can be practiced, can be exercised. You know, we can have uh, temperance when we have an overabundance of food. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so it's, they, they work their way in there, but yeah, just like you say, it's, it's instrumental. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. yeah. And um, when you when you think through this, okay, so you have, I mean, you could classify them as, all right, so you have certain bodily goods that you mentioned, right? Um, shelter, um, mm -hmm. food, obviously, water, these kinds of things, which are absolutely necessary for bodily function. And we need our body in order to do our contemplating and uh, our readings and whatnot and attend our liturgies. Uh, yeah. So you need those basic requirements, but also you know, you also need certain amount of riches, right? You need yeah. certain money in order to purchase things that you're unable to um, produce yourself, especially in our modern economy. But it's even true for St. Thomas as well. He speaks of riches often. Uh, yeah. So you need bodily goods. You need, you need certain riches uh, in order to uh, perfect the, the body as an instrument to enable to contemplate. But I think the, those particular goods those particular body goods are most effectively prudentially obtained through the rural life mm -hmm. yeah. as opposed to um, some urban or suburban life now I, that's obviously a bold claim i think we understand that intuitively to be true otherwise we wouldn't be doing what we're doing mm -hmm. um, but i think there's room to kind of unpack that like why would the rural life be a better way or better means to obtain these necessary uh, instrumental goods for human flourishing? Yeah. I think for bodily needs and for riches, what is unique about rural life is its limiting capacity. Yes. By, by farming, you, you're not prone or you're less prone to the excesses of both riches and bodily goods. Yeah. Right? A farmer can only produce so much. Mm -hmm. right? And as a consequence, you're limited to what you produce and you're limited seasonally to what you produce. And as a consequence of that, you don't fall into the excesses of the body. It's very rare, for example, that you see um, a real intemperate farmer. <laughs> yeah. Especially yeah, it's incompatible one who's trying to be self-sustaining farming, right? Yeah, uh, it's it's almost impossible. And not only that, of course, um, but the food that is produced, if it's you know produced well, and the husband, the animal, the, the individuals who's producing and, and farming the you know the, the husbandman, if you will, um, 
if he's raising his his sheep or his cows or his chickens or his geese well and feeding them well, there's a certain nutritional benefit to that way of life. There's a certain density, nutritional density of that food, which requires him to eat less. Yes. Right. As you all know, right? If you're eating just copious amounts of fat and yes. proteins, then there's no need to refuel your body for contemplating every two hours. I mean, we're in the middle, uh, we're Catholics, so we're in the middle of the great fast, mm -hmm. right? And today's a fast day, right? It's Friday. And, yeah. you know, but if you're eating well, uh, then fasting becomes a lot easier. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like even, we're, I'm just reading, um, we just got done reading the Iliad with a group of students that I'm working through. Yeah. And you have these warriors, the Trojans and the Achaeans, and the, they're battling, like strenuous battling on the field all day long. There's no snack breaks. Yeah. <laughs> There's no pause. There's no granola bars. <laughs> and then what did they do? They stop at the end of the day, right? There's a pause in battle and they go and feast. They drink, they eat, and what are they eating? Fatty meats, they're grilling open, open on fire. And as a consequence, that nutritional density, they're able to, again, the next day, engage in warfare. And, yeah. you know, for us modern slobs, you know, we sit at our desks and uh, because we're just eating this highly processed uh, foods and complex and simple sugars, we need to constantly refuel. Yeah. And, and as a consequence of that, we're more prone to intemperance uh, yeah. and gluttony. Uh, and slothfulness as a consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, so my point is by farming, by rural living and by growing your own food, uh, you're able to fast well, uh, you don't need to eat as much. You're limited by the amount of food that you that you can produce. But the food you do produce actually sustains you in a much more uh, perfect way than if you were to be buying produce from the grocer, yes. the modern grocer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, it's uh, in my more cynical moments, which tend to be uh, perpetual and all the time. I it's amazing yeah, to look at. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I you, it, it's almost like our entire food system is uh, currently in the modern world is ordered towards I mean, obviously, I guess it's it's too obvious to even say but it's it is ordered towards concupiscence toward towards overindulgence. Mm -hmm. um, down to the minutia, down to the minute details, it's reckless availability and the complete effacing of any labor in the production thereof for the consumer, even to the point where like, you don't even have to toil by waiting for five minutes for it. It'll come in four minutes, you know, and it, it will be, I mean, it's, it's just one step removed from, uh, you know, like an IV or something, a food tube just injected immediately with even removing the toil of chewing. Um, and at the same time, convincing you that the most elemental thing, important thing about you is that you choose what you eat <laughs> and you only eat what you like, mm -hmm. uh, which is. I, it, it, it's it's a complete um, illusion because it's all supplied to you, and it's it basically sets us up. It it takes extraordinary effort to work against that. I think in our modern era, where you have to actually um, make an act of will to not be carried away, you know, and uh, in that in that illusion, and in mm. just reckless gluttonous you know gluttony and and in overindulgence uh, because like you say it's i think thomas or at least this you know father speltz has a nice uh book on this the importance of rural life according to the philosophy of saint thomas and he brings this out too that there is this built-in limit and that's what to agriculture to producing your own food mm -hmm. and uh that is the beauty of uh the production of the family farm. And it even has within it its natural uh, booms and busts, you know, its natural fasts, feasts, and famines mm -hmm. built into the calendar year just by virtue of what you're able to produce. And even for the feasts, there's always a, a satiation 
a satisfaction which is based on the richness of its food of the food itself not on the uh the simple you know quantitative indulgence and too much of it like when we kill a pig it's like okay it it becomes our chore to consume all of the fat becomes our duty before it goes off or we lose it or you know it's it spoils in some way and so we are we are in fat and i love this he he kind of distills these what he says father spelts uh the four ends of labor according to saint thomas uh which he says fit perfectly with uh you know agriculture is sort of a a the perfect example of these four ends of manual labor he says manual labor is directed first and principally to obtain food secondly to remove idleness thirdly to curb concupiscence and fourthly to alms giving and agriculture kind of does that in a preeminent way mm -hmm. there's also i think it's in the same text he brings it up or or maybe it's in de regno um where saint thomas talks about how rural life is also a benefit not only to the individual because of all these various goods which you label yeah. uh but also to the state hmm. not just be able to provide the material necessities of the body politic uh but also because it produces men fit for battle yeah mm, wow. Yeah. which is quite interesting right i mean yeah. um and of course john senior talks about this quite a bit too and says you know all this kind of he's writing in the 70s if anyone familiar with john senior and his his life and his work he's uh, he's very impactful in this local area as far as a yeah. kind of catholic intellect who's kind of thought profoundly about these issues and and uh, his footprints are pretty much everywhere in the midwest uh, but anyways senior speaks he has these two great books the the restoration of christian Carlster and the death of christian culture uh but he speaks about how you know this kind of modern notion of gymnasiums and working out and how ridiculous this is because all you need to do is pick up a rake right that, that should be sufficient uh yeah. for your exercise uh, which is it's true for anyone who's actually tried to to labor and till soil and uh yeah have a go at providing most of if not all your food from the land yeah it's toilsome right yeah. um, and that toiling makes the body fit for yeah. other things aside from farming mm -hmm. yeah it, it, it's it's a it's a solution to your femininity in many ways which is again yeah. it's a very modern problem yes the inordinate mm -hmm. attachment to comfort and mm -hmm. it's yeah i love uh there's this group of, uh, they're not philosophers, but men, they say some profound things sometimes. It's these, there's these women in, from the British women from the 60s and 70s and 80s who wrote cookbooks. And uh, because they were mothers, they had a really good perspective. And they, they, they took for granted the, um, the centrality of the family table. That was, that was their end you know, the end of agriculture of an end proper to the family is to nourish itself, even according to St. Thomas, you know, he talks about these levels, you know, the family has certain ends and ends proper to the family are nourishment and education of the children. And mm -hmm. then you go to the village. And you know, the, those ends might relate on that on that higher level to uh, a, the un a trade, the production of a particular trade. And then you go to a principality and a city and it kind of goes out from there, but proper to the family, one of the ends proper to the family is it nourishing itself. And so these, these women would go and they, they would go from Britain over the channel and they would live in uh, peasant villages in France and uh, central Europe and all over the place. And they would write these cookbooks and they have this uh, beautiful insight into peasant life. And they all say the same thing. That's what's interesting to me about it. They all and they all say it so eloquently because they're British and they can write. But they say that uh, it, they're all coming at what I think is this, this beauty, this order, this peace of 
a sufficiency of bodily goods, mm. which, and what they describe it as like Elizabeth Laird calls it comfortable survival of her neighbors, you know, and uh, Jane Gregson calls it well off frugality. And I think they're going for this. What they see in their neighbors is, you know, they've got a mule, they've got a pig, they've got a couple of geese in the barnyard, and they've got a small grove of grapes, you know, or, uh, you know, a small vineyard and a few fruit, fruit trees and their neighbors come to them and they, they teach these modern British people from London, how to live in their village by mm. showing them agriculture and, uh, even showing them how to kill pigs. You know, they'll, it, there's this Elizabeth Laird tells this great story of, uh, her pig harvest. And the first time her neighbor, you know, told her, you're going to need a mule. You're going to need a couple pigs. This is how you live here. This is how you survive and how you provide for your family. You're going to need so many, so many rods of corn and so on. And when it comes to slaughter the pig, to the pig harvest, um, Elizabeth Laird finds herself in her kitchen, you know, trying to, I think they were trying to clean the intestines and tie knots in them f to fill with sausage, all with the help of her neighbors guiding her through this process. And she's just fumbling miserably with the intestines. She just can't quite get a knot on it at all. And she just feels so, so inadequate. And uh, her, her neighbor turns to her and says, you know, my dear Elizabeth, did your mother teach you nothing? <laughs> 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 and she's like, yes, she, yeah, well, not this. So yeah, kind of nothing. And it's, it's, uh, it's part of this, you know, ineptitude that we all share because so much of this um, of agricultural life is passed down. It is tradition. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I feel like we're all in that position. We're all fumbling with yeah. the slippery intestines and try like, how, how do I grow enough wheat for bread? Or, you know, how do I do all of these things? And uh, in the absence of that ancestral knowledge, we're just kind of, we're, we're kind of pioneering, which is a very yeah. American thing to do. Well, I, I look at it. I mean, we're a bunch of posers. posers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that may be a Canadian term, uh, yeah. but yeah, we're just, yeah, we were completely severed right from yeah. that traditional way of living. And even, and we have nowhere to go, absolutely yeah. nowhere to turn, to, to figure out how to yeah, tie a knot at the end of intestine. Yeah. I would just, there's, there's nowhere to turn. Um, and so, yeah, it becomes very cumbersome and difficult for this new generation of individuals who are trying to reclaim, um, our native homeland. Yeah. And it, um, and yeah, it is a, a pioneering space for sure. Um, but yeah. there's some, some beauty and goodness as well as a consequence of being the first to try to do this. And someone has yeah. to make the great sacrifice. And I think yeah. our generation, and we're trying to make that great sacrifice for others uh, in order to kind of fumble our way through to give them something, something to pass on to our children. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was, I was, I was kind of startled by what you're saying in regards to these, these British authors and, and, um, you know, talking about it's a simple life, but it's a life still of abundance. Yes. And of joy. Um, and that's not what our culture tells us. Right. Rather, you know, there's a fear of scarcity. Yes. Right. We're just constantly fearful uh, that there's not enough. Right. And, and as a consequence, you know, we just have recourse to, you know, kind of technological means um, to overcome the fear that we have that we'll never have enough of things mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to once again, turning to the land, trying as best we can to cultivate our own food. Uh, and that as a result, I think gives us great, or it is a means by which grace can intervene because mm -hmm. all of a sudden now you realize how dependent you are upon something other than yourself and something yeah. other than market forces. Yes. Yeah. And isn't it strange that, you know, we feel at the same time, if you just limit yourself to uh, the sort of the, the consumer paradigm of how to acquire food just by trade, by trade alone, um, 
you are all all the advertising for food the entire system is to give you the illusion of your own independence um whereas the the dependence upon the land and the sufficiency that arises from that is actually what gives you that that tie into reality where you do see the fragility of the system but at the same time you have of you know of the order of nature and of the seasons and of the growing capacity of your soil and everything but at the same time that gives you confidence uh in your ability to survive and maybe even survive comfortably mm -hmm. um in an in an ordered way uh without yeah, feeling bad about it and I, I would imagine these british women can write so well is because even though they're you know, tilling the soil, they're planting, they're growing, they're brewing, they're doing everything that they are required to do in order to have a well-ordered domestic home. Uh, they're doing so um, not out of fear. Right. Right. It's not right. fear-based, yeah. uh, but rather there's a, there's a, what spurs them on, I would imagine, and hopefully spurs all of us on is not, I need to get off grid. I need to divorce myself from modern food systems because of, you know, all the political machinations that are happening and concern. Um, but rather, it's a good yeah. to be on the land. Um, and it's a joy to be able to participate as secondary causes in the great ordering of things. Right? right? I mean, we, we, we can put on the mind of God in a certain way by cultural building. Right, we can be secondary causes uh, to bring about the perfection of things, mm -hmm. which is quite beautiful. Like your sheep are flourishing uh, because of your intervention. Yeah. This conversation will be continued in a forthcoming part two episode. Thanks for listening and peace be with you.